1998. <laughs> Var was Jay. <laughs> I was still a lighty. That was like 20 kilograms ago. I was a confused lighty. Or innocent. Lighty. Where were you, Cabello? I was a confused lighty. <laughs> <laughs> this hour we're hanging out with Cabello <laughs> Mabalane, one of my favorite South Africans. And um, yeah, I, I said a little bit earlier, I'm sure you wondered, right? Even when your book came out, I ran for my life. I actually reached out to your, your publisher of my own accord and said, I must be there for this launch. Forced myself to be there. And mm. I have a fascination with your story. And I think it's the incredible authenticity with which you tell your life story. So I've been waiting to get back on the wireless because at that time I wasn't okay. on the wireless oh, yes, yes, to yes. do the wireless version oh, of what awesome. we did. At exclusive books. Awesome. We were pretty rushed that day. <laughs> we were, we especially were with rushed. all your fans being there. Thank you so much for coming. Thank in. you for having me, you see, yeah, we, We're really looking forward to yeah, hanging man. out. Yeah. Listen, you know, rereading this book, it was just as special as the first time. Awesome. Um, and even more so because I, obviously, we when we reread books, we have new experiences that we bring to the reading process. So sure. books don't go out of fashion. Stories remain relevant. Your life story is still relevant. And if you haven't, in the unlikely event that you haven't got a copy, uh, please Please make sure that you harass the people at the bookstores where you go and shop. If you can't find it on the shelves, they will order it. I ran for my life my story, and it really is absolutely, absolutely incredible. Um, in fact, I um, will be buying a batch of these for a bunch of youngsters in, awesome. in Soweto, um, 80 of them, in fact, because I think the story that you tell is just so amazing. Many people need to read it. So congrats once again on, thank on, on you, this Thank you. Thank you, CBS. I appreciate it. Let's start, in fact, uh, with uh, with your early childhood growing up in Soweto and paint, mm-hmm. us, paint us a picture. Um, the first couple of chapters of your story, you, you talk about your relationship with your family, yes. with uh, your grandparents as well that you spend time with, sometimes during the weeks because the parentals had to work, and later on it only used to be over the weekend. What are some of your early childhood memories? Sure. Um, yeah, my some of my early childhood memories... You know, uh, you know, just you know, sprinkled with uh, having the greatest of time with, with my gran, as you as you mentioned, my parents, uh, I guess, focused on, on work and trying to you know give us, and and give myself and my siblings the best future possible. Mm. Um, you know, always working and, and, and with their heads down. Um, in the trenches um, and yeah just you know my gran you know played such an integral you know part uh, uh, in, in my life uh, I remember I remember a guy came to speak at our church Mark Gango he goes around the world talking about how to laugh your way to a to, to, to a happy marriage and he the one of the first things he said when he got onto stage he said and i think he said this about 10 years ago i was in my 30s and he said um if you're not married now chances are your children aren't going to have grandparents <laughs> and uh, it's it really it really um those those words held so much weight because you know it just took me back to the you know mm. to the amazing role my grand uh, parents played in my life so when i think back i think back fondly of you know the relationship i had with my grandparents um how my mom and dad really worked hard in you know in a time in our country where things weren't sure. uh, necessarily easy for them and uh, you know, I you know I, I look back in shock um, yeah. whenever I speak with, to my mom. My dad passed away in 2003 um, at 
at how they did it. You Absolutely, know, three yeah. siblings uh, through private schools on, you know, a third or maybe even a fifth of what I'm making now. Mm. You know, so that when I when I look back, you incredible know, resilience. It's, it's just yeah, yeah, the resilience and and my father teaching me about, you know, hard work. Mm. I want to come back to your dad because yeah. your dad, as you know, fascinates me. He he comes <laughs> in and out of your story. Sure. If one had to do a word count, he appears in the story in this book more often than mom does, and it's interesting wow. how we how I didn't we have realized that. Yeah, and I, I thought that the first time I read the book, when I reread it, I realized as well. You spend a lot of time describing him in all sorts of ways. Sure. And I think it's sometimes maybe I don't know, especially a parent that's still physically around. It's not that we value them less than the other parent, but maybe subconsciously the other parent we've had a silent relationship with them. And one of the beautiful things about memoirs is that it just lifts things to the surface wow. that maybe was bubbling under. But I like authors reading. Um, don't worry, I'll give you ten out of ten for oral. <laughs> just the the paragraph that I've marked there. This is Cabello describing just Pimville, uh, the, his childhood and some of the games that he was up to. In Pimville, we were a stone's throw away from the main road, but when I was a kid, the streets were pretty empty. We would play, ride, we would play, ride our bikes. There was a game called Chicago, um, where we used to build up these towers out of empty tins. We would make a stack of them, then the Frisco coffee can at the bottom, then a jam can, then, then, and so on, <laughs> from the biggest to the smallest, with the baked bean cans at the top. And then we would have to stand maybe 20 meters away behind some line and throw a tennis ball at the tower until it was knocked over. At which point that team would have, would have, would have to run and try to build it as fast as they could, while the other team tried to get them out by throwing the tennis ball at them instead of the cans. We would shout, Chicago, either after we knocked the tins over or after we'd finished building. We also played Black Mamba Dile, which was like hide and go seek. Some of the games involved nursery rhymes, which I absolutely loved because it was all about the rhythm. The, ryth the rhythm was everything. It's Amoreka Omo, Ingi Omo. We could play that for hours. We would start with the beginning part, then there was another whole section, and it got harder and harder as it went along. And if we made a mistake, we'd start all over again. I love it. <laughs> you know, I love it because there were parts of your description at the early chapters of Soweto that reminded me of. Of a book by Jacob Lamini called Native Nostalgia. We don't take anything away from the struggles of our parents against the monster that was apartheid. But despite, rather than because of apartheid, it was amazing how much childhood and how much ordinary family life was still possible 100%, 100%. without necessarily trying to romanticize the, the, the hardships. I think we knew it was there. I mean, like whenever it's funny, whenever somebody says Pimble, I, I, I remember the day of the state of emergency like it was yesterday. I was at Mayfair Convent. We weren't allowed to go to school. And we stayed in the hood. And these Caspers came into the, uh, into the hood, uh, shooting tear gas, everyone running away. But as young kids, we were having a blast. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we were away from school. <laughs> we, 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 we didn't look at these, uh, you know, uh, soldiers coming into the, into the hood as enemies. We were, to, to us, it was just one big game. Sure. <laughs> and it was about not getting shot uh -huh. and, uh, you know, running, jumping over the fence into the next door neighbors and, you know, putting a wet towel over your eyes so that yes, the tear gas doesn't right. kind of get into your eyes. But it was one big game. And, and like, like you say, even you know, even if there were atrocities happening around our country, we we still found a way of just carrying on, and yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and 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 like you said, it was a beautiful thing. So on your dad, right? So <clears throat> you tell your story chronologically, but dad comes in and out of the story in all sorts of ways, and and I can see you grappling to to honor him, to not judge him, to understand his folly. And you also, as an adult, realized what you actually were taught by your dad, incredible commitment towards to authenticity and also to honesty. Mm -hmm. And that's this, despite the fact that he often, as you put it, self-medicated with alcoholism. Mm -hmm. So you write, for example, on page 40, the following. My dad drank and I loathed it because I saw what his drinking did to my family. Having an alcoholic as a father is embarrassing. You're that kid who has that dad. You'll be playing with the other kids on your street, and you have to go through the awkwardness of your dad walking past you, pissed out of his skull. Once he'd walked past and was inside the house, it was all over. But still, that moment could feel very, very long. 
A little bit later, uh, you have this to say in a different context, and the context is not important for now. On page 53, Cabello writes, um, and now he's reflecting a little bit on his musical success later on, before he goes back to his childhood and slowed down the story again. But he writes this. My mom was still very supportive, but I never wanted to face my dad because I just felt like such a disappointment to him. I think he wanted me to become more than he was, and he never got the music thing. Even five years later, after I'd sold 700,000 records, launched my own solo career, my album had just gone gold, he still didn't support me. You've got a very complicated relationship with the memory of your dad. Sure. It could be easy to judge one's dad as being harsh, as being an alcoholic, as not supporting your music career, but but you render your dad very complex. You know, uh, because I struggled with the with his uh, struggle with alcohol uh, as a young child and his sometimes, you know, volatile relationship with my mom being a firstborn son, <clears throat> it was difficult to make sense of you know, um, having a dad like that. Mm. And then you grow up and then you become a man and then you start having certain struggles and then, you know, all these words that he used to speak, you actually start to see him as like a normal human being who had who had his struggles, but in spite of his struggles, you know, had the foresight of, of saying these things which have helped me become the man that I am today. So in the book, I, I, I decided um, and... I decided to uh, uh, um, be, be, be authentic and honest about how I felt and what we faced, but also, um, you know, honor the man that he was because it didn't take away from who he was. You know, those were just his struggles. And many of us are like that, you know. And then there were um, silent influences, right, that maybe you didn't appreciate as a child. For example, you used to think that he was simply trying to tor torture you and your mom by playing jazz music, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. And he had an incredible passion and oh, an amazing no. collection as well. Amazing collection. And um, as a child, you don't always respect that. And then later in your 20s and 30s, you want to be all clever about I, uh, connections across Cross genres. <laughs> I mean, I remember we we went to a funeral together in Alexandra, and obviously now this is me very kind of entrenched in the music business, you know, very well versed in you know many genres. And um, I was playing Frank Sinatra in the car. He had stepped out, and I quickly put on Frank Sinatra and <laughs> pretended yeah. as if nothing was happening, you know. And I was driving that, and I was impressing him, you know. <laughs> and he said. Huh. Frank Sinatra. I've been playing Frank Sinatra since you were five years old. <laughs> I was like, this guy never changes. When are you ever going to say, wow, Frank Sinatra, flip, I never knew you had that kind of taste in music. <laughs> but that's what I loved about him. You know, he never, ever gave up ground. You really need to work. You needed to work for every inch. And it's a principle that, 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 I've, that, that I've used to my, to my benefit. One of the most beautiful gifts parents want to give us, especially our parents who didn't have it because of apartheid, is a really soft education and your mom in particular as the educationalist she she made sure that that's the one thing that you would get mm. and we often think that all the best things happen in the north mm. and yes you loved going to saints and we're going sure. to talk about saints but sure. actually your journey towards a multicultural education started already in Mayfair when you went to Mayfair convent and you honor your experiences there you write this about Mayfair convent you say from the time I arrived at Mayfair convent I can remember almost everything it was amazing there was a white teacher, there were black kids and colored kids and Indian kids, and I was like, what kind of place is this? I remember the teacher trying to speak to me in English. Her name was Mrs. Judith Lacey, and she was a godsend. Her husband and my dad both worked together at Liberty Life. The first day I arrived, she tried to ask me something. I can't remember exactly what she said because I couldn't speak any English. I still don't know what kind of sentence I put together when I tried to reply. But that day is the last day I remember not being able to speak English. After that, it was all Ben the dog and <laughs> Felix the cat and Judith Lacey who were sweet and caring and nurturing. I took to that environment like a fish to water. Now, I've got many good friends and some of my friends' kids who go to Sacred Heart. But I really like your depiction of Mayfair Convent because a school like Sacred Heart, where you only spend one year, it often is all the rage in terms of like, you know, politically correct, multicultural, yeah. woke education. Sure. And yet your experiences at Mayfair Convent was so positive, and I want you to describe it a bit more, that Sacred Heart wasn't good enough, which is why you couldn't cope there. <laughs> 
Um, I guess Mayfair, and I've actually just thought about it for the first time, um, entered my life in those formative years. And you know as well as I do that those formative years are absolutely uh, paramount in terms of um, how a child gets molded. So being being exposed to a multicultural South Africa at such a young age made it so normal for me. And uh, it's actually helped me later on in life understanding that we actually just are all people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I just loved, I remember celebrating Eid with uh, with the Indian kids where they'd go home and celebrate Eid and they'd all bring cake the next day because it's, you know, they'd broken the fast. And, you know, it was, you know, the colored kids with the way they spoke and um, just that multiculturalism in, 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 in the school. Just, I, I, mean, I remember playing tennis with, uh, you know, Grant Souls and, and Jason Stoltenkamp. And these were all my, these were all my friends. We had white teachers. You know, like, like, and you like honor Grant as well. I mean, you got yeah. a lot of important hand me downs from him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was important for a lady that doesn't sure. necessarily have everything. 100%. Right? Grant was a, you know, God always puts a Grant in my life. Mm. You know, a guy who's always just there for me, supporting me, loving me for who I am, and, uh, you know, taking the seriousness out of life. Mm. You know, especially, like you say, with a lady that didn't have much. You know, Grant just didn't, you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, take it so seriously. Absolutely. Mm. When you got to St. Stitians, yes. you really like took to it like a duck to water. Yeah. And all the things that, that maybe now, especially the younger ones, will critique about a lot of these schools that we didn't critique when we entered them, mm-hmm. those were the things that you loved. Like, for mm-hmm. example, the sense of tradition, hierarchy, rules, all of those things, mm-hmm. even rugby. Even no girls. You In know, fact, you mentioned that as the first yeah, thing that was important. Yeah, because, you know, with the hormones running crazy at 13, 14, I remember at Sacred Heart, you know, the at primary school, having girls around was great because, you know, uh, you know, no one's dating and no one has to impress everybody. We're all still growing. But, you know, at 13, having to, you know, Valentine's Day was a, you know, a, a, a day of big <laughs> pressure because, you know, how many roses did you receive? If you didn't receive roses, then you were, you know, you were the butt of jokes. Um, so you get to Sacred Heart, I mean, to St. Stithians, there were no girls. It's like, okay, cool. Boys, we just focus on kind of what needs to be done. And that for me, I, I, I yeah, I thrive. And then in tandem with that, because you, you point out two things. Girls weren't there, so that was a, a, a simplification of your, your teenage yeah. years. And then as a result of that, the friendships that you were forging immediately, yeah. like with Tokolo, yes. those were going to be defining moments of your life. Yeah. I mean, how many of us look back to high school and say, a key part of my identity and where I fit into the country in my 20s and 30s Mm. go goes back to high school to high school Mm. that is that is really special I think uh, it's part of the you know the 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 romantic side of the TKZ story you know where uh, where it all started and um, and it's as if we all knew you know the three of us when we got together at school that not necessarily that something special was going to happen but that you know there was a special bond between Mm. uh, the three of us now you were too fat to play hockey, even though you tried. Yeah. And the teacher said, no, you better try your luck at rugby. Yeah. You didn't like it at first, yeah. but being uber competitive, you mm. were desperate to be in the first team. Yeah. You were mostly in your final year, the second team captain, but sure. every now and then sure. you got a cameo appearance in the first sure. team. You had an opportunity to go to the States and then you come back. And again, you think to yourself, maybe I, I might play rugby professionally, I honestly but, 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 but it just wasn't to be, was it? And the entry into music and I want you to take over from this point sure is that at some point you have to reckon with the fact like many of us did for me it was with the piano I realized I could never be a concert pianist sure I mean not study a beamers otherwise I'm going to become a music teacher in Oats or something sure you had to reckon with the fact that you're not going to be a professional rugby player mm-hmm. although you love rugby mm-hmm. and so music was almost an, a byproduct of that self-disappointment it was but then when I look back on it um, you know music was this force um, happening parallel to my whole life. It's a constant, and you could look at it as, you know, you know somebody who's been training since, since um, their formative years at music. Not necessarily playing, but there's a lot that comes from studying different genres and understanding music arrangement, and this was happening parallel my whole life, different genres. So 
yes, not playing, you know, professional sport was a was a disappointment. But when I crossed over to music, and you know, when music became the only option, there was a lot to. Um, you know, I, I I had a lot to give because I deposited quite a lot in, 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 in inside of myself. And you were lucky that your two friends from high school sure. were were really, really incredibly gifted uh, musically as youngsters. Sure. And you kind of came back from the States and slotted in. In fact, upon your arrival back, you were shocked to see one of them already sure. uh, as a professional. For sure, yeah. I remember landing, coming back from a short-term exchange program with Rotary and landing in uh, Jan Smart Airport then. Um and driving out and seeing a Mashamplani poster and seeing Tukulo, you know, on, on the poster. And, uh, you know, I landed and my trip overseas just kind of, kind of, you know, opened my mind to endless possibilities. So, you know, being academically challenged, coming back thinking, what the hell am I going to do? When I saw Tukulo on the poster, um, you know, it was endless possibilities. I looked for him and, you know, the rest is history. Now, basically, you guys find yourself... At the back of a house in Linden, you start making a bit of music. The first EP doesn't go that well, but then the second one, boom. Mm. Um, and that was due to, I guess, the first one, we kind of made music that we we liked and that we thought people would like. Um, we weren't, you know, familiar with what kind of was going on in the industry. And then after after that, you know, I mentioned that we took it upon ourselves to, you know, get acquainted with what was going on. You know, who were the um, who were the big fish and kind of what was happening sonically. And, you know, we started club hopping and kind of getting to grips with what was going on, building some relationships in the industry as well. Because, you know, like I say in the book, we had a kind of gang mentality in the sense that, you know, we, you know, which was built from being in school together. So, you know, we just were this awesome team and we didn't have any outside influences. But after we did our homework and uh, we kind of understood what was going on sonically, we, we knew exactly what was required of us. But even so, I mean, when Shubobo dropped, mm. selling, what, 100,000 copies just in the first month, I mean, sure. you, could, you couldn't have predicted yeah. that kind of success. Uh, we could have. At that time, <laughs> at that time we, we, we kind of, it was, you know, anything that left the studio was, we, like, we weren't second-guessing ourselves. We knew exactly what we were doing and what was going to happen. Um, it was just the question of how big it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the problem with success is that it also comes with all sorts of access to money yeah. and money that you were not used to before. Yeah. And with that, you suddenly find yourself drinking, um, just going to clubs, passing out, doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, was it, uh, is it just an intrinsic part of, 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 you think, the music industry worldwide that those kind of trappings come with with that kind of early success, particularly as young people? Uh, I think it's got nothing to do with the music business. But, you know, I guess, you know, people will argue that the lifestyle that the music business comes with is conducive to, you know, a certain lifestyle. Hmm. But then I always want to kind of, whenever I always say that it's not about the music business, I, I, I always want to highlight that, you know, people do drugs and abuse drugs because of, you know, self-medicating, because they're trying to deal with whatever issue. And that, that happens across all industries. Mm -hmm. um, that's why people abuse drugs. That's why, you know, people become, become, become addicts. One of the difficulties, right, and uh, <laughs> This is a conversation you and I started, but I, I still want to explore, explore it with you now mm. and also further be beyond this interview that, that will come to an end in the next 20 minutes. Sure. Is the incredible relationship that then happens, not by design, but through habit, between your creativity and your creative output and, and addiction. Mm -hmm. And um, you started having a lot of... I think you call it euphoric recall mm -hmm. about how many of some of your most amazing music is music that was written or produced in moments when you were quite literally on something, yeah. right? And, and that obviously fuels the addiction because it means that sobriety can be very scary sure. if you have so many memories of making excellent creative stuff sure. while you are on drugs. Sure. And, you know, I'd say granted uh, uh, most of kind of, you know, uh, let me say 
about you know 60 percent of of the music that that i've made you know i was in i was somewhere else mm. but when i cleaned up in 2002 and went to rehab almost kind of wanting to prove it to myself that you can create um outside of uh, you know being being outside of addiction and i did mm. uh, i mean my biggest you know my biggest selling solo album i did clean and sober uh, in fact number two and number three uh, were clean and sober so you know the notion that you can only create um you know when 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 you're on cocaine or, mm. or, or ecstasy is 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 rubbish <clears throat> but it's extremely hard for us as creatives whether we are writers or musicians or actors sure. to take seriously the prospect of still being able to do stunning creative work sure. sober when we have become caught in in the lifestyle right so so cabello writes the following in page 59 uh, when he reflects on <laughs> on on halloween <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be voyeuristic, but I want people to... This is part of why I love you. You've lived an examined life, dude. You write the following, and I'm not even taking the, the most salacious bits. You're going to have to buy the book, I'm afraid. Uh, if you want to know about the pizza guy, go, go buy the book. <laughs> During the recording of our first album, we worked with someone who also used to DJ on the rave scene. The rave scene was much more progressive from a drug perspective. One day, this guy asked me if I'd ever tried ecstasy. We were in studio when I tried it. I even remember what song we were recording. In fact, it was the whole album after that, the whole of Halloween. I was taking ecstasy and it was ecstasy. I was just like, oh, this is amazing. There was an arrogance that came with more money. I'm not on weed anymore. I'm on ecstasy, I thought to myself. Even then, I always told myself I would never take cocaine. That was crossing some line in terms of drugs. But ecstasy was cool because it made me feel good. And I love the combination of ecstasy and marijuana. I pop a pill, smoke a joint, and it was like heaven. And we made such great music. Music, But the following sentence is very important, right? Especially for young people who are listening. That was how Pandora's box got opened. I'd gone there for the first couple of days. After I tried ecstasy, I thought, what the hell was that? And then I thought, I want to go there again. So I would take ecstasy once every two days, then once a day, then twice a day, then three times a day. I was also drinking. So you have to add booze to the mix. For that period, I guess... It's not surprising I have a pretty euphoric recall. Um, and then it goes on to say, Halloween came out in 1998 and it was a classic of note. If I do say so myself, I can actually hear you saying that. <laughs> it really defined the sound of an era. It was a pivotal moment. But of course, your first sense that this is going out of control is that the Samas, you win all of these awards. Mm. Um, and then the media start coming up after you guys after that. But even then, you still have the sense of we are it, we are larger than life. What is the way to speak back to entertainment journalists is to come up with another track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I hadn't connected the dots that the de deterioration in behavior was due to the drugs. I, you know, I... I I, I blamed, you know, jealousy, uh, you know, people wanting to take me down, um, you know, the media just having kind of ulterior motives and not taking responsibility to, you know, an understanding that, uh, you know, my behavior was changing and, and, and becoming appalling because of, you know, my abuse of drugs and alcohol and other substances. And... How do you feel now about some of the things you did under under the influence? Sure, I mean, I still have guys, you know, people coming because you up were to you me. were exceptionally exceptionally honest in your self examination, right? I mean, I we, we don't make light of it, by the way, to anyone who's wondering why we're chuckling. It's a it's a pleasant but sure. awkward chuckle between me and Cabello. He hit a pizza guy that came back to haunt him when the lawyer reached out to him years later. Uh, police confiscating drugs on him, and then bribery happens, passing out at one o'clock in a club, being woken up at six in the morning. I mean, the, these are these are not moments of your life that you're necessarily proud of nah, i mean you um you know it, they are it, it it is still embarrassing uh but uh, i have to almost understand that i can't you know stay 
embarrassed because you know I have to talk about it um, as a, as a cautionary tale, um, and it does it doesn't feel good. I, I remember even you know when Nahama, who's who helped me write the book, uh, you know when I was talking through some of these experiences. Um, you know, it, it it was just embarrassing, and uh, going there is 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 never easy. It becomes easier because it it almost feels as if we, when I'm sitting here talking to you, see this that it was like another person because I'm talking about 17 years ago. But I never take away you know from the fact that these things did happen. You know, I did hurt a lot of people. Um, you know, I caused a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, you had a baseball. Yeah, I had bat a, that you kept in I your. Had a, I had a baseball yeah. bat, and I used it. it even had a name. Uh, I can't remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's it's unacceptable behavior. You know, period. Mm. Um, you know, like you say, we chuckle, but it is kind of an uncomfortable chuckle. But you know what? You you've taught me so much about um, the incredible life lessons that can also come out of really, really dark periods of one's mm. life. You reflect, for example, which a lot of us snigger at who haven't had to go there on what you were taught in rehab. And you come back to rehab as sort of like little little gems, various points in this particular book of yours. Mm. And I want you to, to just read from here where it says that I have a conscience. So Cabello reflects on what he's there to grapple with in terms of taking moral responsibility for behavior and almost like learning again to be a full moral agent. And if you have the opportunity to be in rehab and you're not ashamed to go there and he was lucky to have that opportunity, you have to relearn how to be a, a fully responsible person again. So just from there until the end and then we'll take a break. Uh, which one is it here? Yeah, from the, the paragraph okay. on the previous page. He was, a, he was a people pleaser, that's what I see, a people pleaser, and somebody who was afraid to be great. Did I have a conscience? Did I have a conscience? It was always there, but it had become numb because of my state of mind. Because of the drugs and the booze, I got desensitized to stuff. Death was part of my life. I lost friends. I lost friends. As much as I really believe, I still had a conscience. I was able to numb it, to silence it by remaining in active addiction. The same thing happened to my feelings. I felt it, but like it was something very distant. An addict's biggest flaw is not being able to feel. At rehab, I had actually learned how to feel. Later in life, I'm able to feel disappointed, failure. I'm able to feel disappointment, failure, success. I feel every single moment. Are you leaving out the pizza guy? Oh, okay, I'll carry on. <laughs> <laughs> when I hit that pizza guy, I was more worried about how my Saturday night was going to turn out. I didn't think about him or what happened to him after I drove off. I just left. And I never thought about him afterwards. I didn't give rocks about whether, whether or not the guy was dead. It was all about my Saturday night. One of the reasons I enjoyed rehab was that you had to write your life story. I had to start engaging with things, the things I had forgotten about or numbed out. That process, that helped me a lot, a lot. You start seeing things for what they are. Sometimes you think you've run out of things to be thankful for. Then something comes to the fore, to the fore of your life. It jumps out of you. Gratitude. There's always something to be grateful for. Stunning. Love it. We're going to fast forward the story only because of time. Like I said to you, I could do a two-hour documentary of Cabela's life, and it's uh, compelling. It's also deeply instructive. But let's let's forward ac across a couple of themes. You were worried that your career will not take off when you go solo, that you were the weakest link in TKZ. <laughs> that turned out not to be the case. Sure. You also had euphoric recall that, in fact, a lot of your creative output was tied to being on some other drug. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why creatives often fear sobriety. Mm -hmm. Reflect for me in a minute or two on what you have learned about why sobriety and being sober doesn't necessarily mean you are unfun and you can no longer have a creative life. Um, you know, I've had to learn that, um, you know, the 
how to use the raw materials of creativity and understanding that you don't only tap into the raw materials of creativity you know when you high when you when you're honest with yourself it, it's all about authenticity i've learned I'm, I'm i'm working on another album currently i've just been re-inspired to get back into the to the music business and i'm learning to 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 you know for for one to access the raw materials of, of creativity one needs to be true to oneself and um and then everything kind of flows from there um because when you're true to yourself and you are who you are um then you you don't have to be any anyone else and and, and you, you you can draw from a, a really honest place and that honest place just keeps on giving and giving and giving because it's actually you so it's unsustainable to 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 um, to create on on substances because I really believe that you're not actually drawing from who you really really are. You're drawing from this this other person that you'd like to be or you portraying yourself to be. How how long did it take you to come to that insight? And is that is that part of the gift that you got out of rehab? It took it it took a while. I think like very 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 kind of early after rehab. You know the, the the creative process. I was kind of on autopilot, kind of doing the things that I did whilst I was on drugs to create. But now, 16, 17 years later, you know, um, you know, I'm really having to get to a place where, you know, to ask myself honest questions, you know, and, and ask, is that creative thing really in me? Mm. You know, even after all these years. And, you know, one thing that I've learned that I'm also not in this alone, you know, um, it's about teaming up with like minded individuals who, who say certain things, who do certain things that get you to that, um, you know, that moment of eu euphoria where these creative juices start, flo uh, start flowing. So, you know, we can do a whole hour, <laughs> which we will do. I want you back on this show. Sure. Um, about other things that have come to define your sense of purpose in the world. Sure. That sobriety gives you many things, and one of the most beautiful things it gives you, which you don't realize while you are just being a teenager or young adult, like drinking every weekend, mm -hmm. it gives you time. Sure. So you've taken on many projects. Sure. Not just all the stuff with Danny, uh, with Gavin, and with the Shard Foundation, sure. but also like the book stuff that I'm going to help you a little bit out yes, on, and yes. I'm very excited about that as well. Um, but in addition to that, you have changed your relationship with your body. Yes. <laughs> you you weighed almost close to 120 kilogram when you were at your heaviest. Mm -hmm. What has sobriety enabled you to do in terms of rethinking your relationship with your body to the point where you've now completed how many? 11. <laughs> 11 comrades. <laughs> um, Ah, oh, you know the the the, the thought had just ran away from me. But it 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 all goes back for me. It, it goes back with my relationship with with God. I really believe God's best for us is to prosper on all fronts. You know, financially, spiritually, physically, relationally. And part of my, um, you know, understanding that uh, I've got to be the best version of 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 myself stems from that. You know, and. Um, you know, hence getting involved in, you know, physical activity and understanding that for me to be the best person I can be, you know, this part of me, you know, and not only this part of me needs to be functioning mm. at, uh, at optimum. Mm. Mm. There's a shout out there from Gavin on Twitter, actually. <laughs> How's it, Gavin? Papa love, him. <laughs> <laughs> love him. Absolutely love, love him to bits. And um, that, that relationship with, with God, how defining has that been uh, in order to make sure that you, that you don't stray? Because one of the other lessons about addiction that you teach us in this book is that one can be an addict, one is an addict for life and you've got to manage it. And sometimes you will go to social functions, someone will just, just a whiff of alcohol might be a trigger, for example. Sure. So it seems to me that the one thing that helps you to pull yourself back from the brink is the reorientation of your values through the church. Sure, I, I, and I think that plays out in understanding that you will stray, you will fall. But when you fall, fall forward. My pastor, you know, Pastor Ray McCauley, who's been, you know, you know, a voice mm. of reason in my life for the past, you know, 10, 15 years, always teaches us that don't run away from God, run to him. So even when you've messed up, you know, run back to him, you know, um, it's, it's, it's no one is scoring 10 out of 10 anyway. And, you know, as soon as you stop 
trying to strive for perfection, you'll understand, you know, that uh, you, you are loved unconditionally. And, and it's that love, you know, uh, from God for me that has really changed my life. Understanding that it's not about my performance. It's not about me scoring 10 out of 10. It's just understanding that I'm loved unconditionally. And that's what actually changes your life. Okay, so now you are a sober Pansula for life. <laughs> yeah, you know, people say, but are you a Pansula for life now? But I'm like, guys, I said for life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna, and that track, that was a very important moment for you as well. Just to give him, it, it writes in the book about why Pansula for Life was so important. That sense of I can actually journey on my own as well as an artist that matters enormously. We're gonna play out with that. Can uh, I, Eusebius, before we close off, mm-hmm. I just think you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't give uh, honor where honor was due. Nahama Brody. You know, she she's an inter- integral part of sure. you know me sitting here and talking to you right now. Mm. I hope she's listening. Thank you so much, Nakama. Nakama helped me write the book. Mm. I tried to write. Um, it's a special skill, and uh, but I teamed up with somebody who helped me write the book. It was book, a beautiful collaboration. She, absolutely amazing. Mm. I mean, you know her. Okay. Yeah. I also want to see whether you're as strong as you look. Him and I are going to arm wrestle here. You'll see it on the <laughs> 702 Facebook page. In the meantime, we'll uh, have this track as our backdrop. To <laughs> yes, yo. Yes, yo. This cat saga puga love this. This cat saga puga love less. Saga puga less. This cat saga puga love less. This cat saga puga love less. Saga puga less. Everybody move on. Uh-huh. Everybody move on. Come on, come on. Let's go.